Good evening and welcome to MIT. <clears throat> I'd like to start off with a moment of silence and recognition for the uh, victims of the disaster that happened a couple days ago, three days ago, in uh, just across the river. Thank you. Uh, and speaking of silence, this would be a good time to remind people if they have cell phones to uh, turn them off. I'm Eric Adams. Uh, I'm from MIT, and I'm uh, one of eight members of the Freeman Committee. Um, this committee is part of the Boston Society of Civil Engineers section of the American Society of Civil Engineers. And they are responsible for sponsoring this uh, lecture annually. Uh, if you haven't done so already, it would help both MIT and BSCE if you uh, sign the sign-up sheet that's going around. This helps us with our demographics and also for planning on the amount of food to, to get in future years. As many of you know, John Freeman was a graduate of uh, MIT's Department of Civil Engineering. Uh, after graduating, he became a renowned engineer. Uh, famous locally for having designed the original Charles River Dam and nationally for being involved in the water supply systems of a number of communities, including San Francisco and New York City. <clears throat> uh, funds for this lecture come about from a gift that he made to the society back in 1925, which was for the education of young uh, hydraulic and water resource engineers. So this is one of the major things that our committee does uh, with the receipts from the proceeds from this uh, fund. The other thing we do is to make small grants, educational grants to students or young practicing engineers um, to be involved in some sort of educational activity. You can get an idea of what kinds of grants the committee has uh, offered in the past by going to our website which also provides videos of past Freeman lectures, including uh, shortly this one tonight. Uh, the easiest way to get access to that is simply to Google Freeman Fund, and it'll come right up. <clears throat> I guess the last thing I'd like to do is to make a plug for the American Society of Civil Engineers uh, Student Steel Bridge Competition. The regional competition uh, for New England is being held at MIT this year. That's on Saturday uh, from 9 to 5.30 over in the Johnson Athletic Center. That's on the other side of Mass Ave uh, off of Vassar Street. Uh, I think there are 15 uh, universities competing. The ones that come in the top two or three go on to nationals. And I'm proud to say that last year MIT came in number two nationally. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, Karen Kelly, who will do the introduction, the real introduction of our speakers. Thanks, Eric. Hi, good evening, and welcome tonight. I'm pleased to be introducing our speakers for this evening. Um, Larry Murphy will be speaking first. Larry is a professional engineer from CDM Smith. He has over 29 years of experience in the civil engineering field. And through his career, he's worked on a variety of transportation, solid waste, and environmental projects, many of which involve hydraulic and hydrologic mo modeling. He has a BS in civil engineering from the University of New Haven and a BS in management from Ferris State University. Um, presently, he's an area manager in CDM Smith's Northeast region. Uh, following Larry's uh, presentation, we are also going to hear from Mike Bichand. Uh, Mike is a geotechnical engineer with uh, over 14 years of experience. He has a BS and MS degree in geotechnical engineering from UMass Lowell. And he's a registered PE in four states. Currently, Mike is the Levy State Safety Program Manager for the US Army Corps of Engineers New England District. And he is responsible for the execution of the levee safety program for over 60 levee systems throughout New England, including hurricane barriers. I'm very pleased to welcome both of them to MIT here tonight on behalf of the Freeman Fund. Thank you. Larry? 
Thanks, Karen. Can you guys hear me okay? Good. You know, Karen, I had Karen, she was gonna say that I like you know, long walks along the beach too, but I, we, we left that part out. But well, I just wanna thank everyone for being here today and thank MIT and the Boston Society of Civil Engineers section for having us today. You know, hopefully the, you'll, you'll find a pretty informative presentation today. You know, we're really glad that Mike's be able to come here. You're, you're gonna be very interested to see some of the real life uh, workings that the Army Corps does. And, and they've got some good su success stories to tell. So it will, I, think, I think you guys are gonna enjoy this. Um, Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm super Sandy as they call it. Um, it. How many people here were impacted by the Superstorm? Like about half the people here. Um, I know I was, you know, I live in uh, New York and up in Westchester and we were without power for four days up there. And, and we, we had it easy, there was a lot of people that were really impacted by the storm. And, and there's actually a lot of people that still are. There's still subway stations that are closed down there. Um, when, we, when, when I was asked to do this presentation, we had put together a concept design of, of a storm surge barrier that in concert with some other barriers would have, would have worked to protect New York from, from that event from happening. Um, it's, it's been interesting to see, like looking forward now, although obviously they wouldn't be able to get a design at that time, how that would have come into play. So today we'll be talking about a little bit about the storm. Um, Mike's gonna be talking about some of the operations of, of some of their facilities they've, they've got going on. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that concept design that we put together, and then we're gonna present some of the various barriers that they have around the world. Okay, Superstorm Sandy, Sandy, not Sandy, um, hit uh, October 29th. Um, it really wasn't a hurricane when it landed, although there was some hurricane strength wind at the time, they called it a post tropical cyclone. Um, they had some of the highest uh, surge, storm surges on record as a result of the storm. And, and in uh, Bergen Point, in the West Reach in New York, it had an elevation of 14.6. And when you look at the concept design that I did, you'll see how that kind of comes into play with, with, some, with the elevations of the barrier that you would be using. As I said, there were some hurricane strength winds at the time, the gusts up to 100 miles an hour. And interestingly, the rain wasn't that bad. They only had um, over a little less than three and a half inches of rain, which really helped us out a lot with the impacts. It really minimized what, what which could have been a much more um, devastating event. Um, even with that, um, in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, there was $80 billion worth of damage. And there's still thousands of people without, without, without homes still in the New York area. These are some pictures, of some of the damage there. Um, this is one of the tunnels coming into New York. They're all seven of the, of the tunnels coming in and out of New York were flooded at the time. It was really a really horrific storm that came in. And on, on the right here, you can see some of the damage that was done out on the Rockaways. Here's some more pictures here. This one was uh, taken by a, a US Air Force pilot flying through the area. And on the right there is in Brooklyn, some of the taxis there. It was really bad down there. It was really devastating. And interesting, um, the year before Hurricane Irene kind of came up through there too, and it, um, it was, it wasn't, it didn't when it landed. It wasn't, it didn't impact New York as, as bad, but part of that impacted how the people reacted to Hurricane Sandy, and there was a lot of we saw Irene coming just as we saw Sandy coming down there, and you see Mayor Bloomberg like if you don't follow the ex evacuation order, you know people will die. There was a lot of press to kind of get people aware of what was coming. Um, when it came through, it really wasn't that bad. It wasn't, I mean, it wasn't good, but it, the impacts weren't as bad as they thought. And then what happened with Sandy is that people kind of thought, oh, it's gonna be like Irene, and they, they really didn't evacuate like they should have out there. And there are stories of some people that were trapped in their houses and they had to swim to safety. It was, it was, it was bad, and, and a lot of people did die. It's in certainly nothing to, to take lightly. So now um, Mike's gonna talk a little bit about some of their facilities and how they work during the storm. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Larry. Um, so I'm gonna start out, and uh, I know the flyer said two, but I'm gonna talk about the three uh, existing core barriers. Um, and there's actually five, but there's three of which uh, we have 
portions of which we own and operate, mostly because of the navigation gates. Um, so I'll start out and give you a little bit of a background of, uh, briefly touch on the design, some of the key factors uh, that went into it, because uh, like Sandy, uh, there were events that kind of led to these barriers being built. Uh, and all three were sort of built in and around the same time frame. And then I'll touch a little bit on uh, the design, give you a brief overview of uh, what they look like in case you're not familiar of them, with them. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, how they operate, mostly the gates, um, and then uh, give you some uh, history or perspective on how they fared during Sandy. And uh, you'll see one of them in particular was really, um, uh, I guess, a success story. So the historical storm events, um, what I have here is showing uh, a couple of the uh, New England hurricanes. Uh, most of these were category three or a significant event um, that were considered when the Corps went through the original design of all three barriers. Uh, you'll notice the really one of the big ones here is the 1938. Uh, that was called the Long Island Express. Um, that one was a significant storm in the, of, because of a couple reasons. One, over 600 people uh, died in that storm, but it caused a lot of damage and also had a significant rainfall associated with it. Um, and this storm, in a, also with uh, some of the 1936 storms, led to also uh, a lot of the levees being built. Uh, the next couple here, uh, the Carroll, the 1954, um, you'll see the 1815 storm, which was a significant one, which had a large uh, surge of about uh, 11 feet um, measured in uh, Nantasket. Um, but again, that was before um, really the scales came out. And then you'll see the uh, Donner here, uh, 1960, uh, which is this one. Um, the other and the most important one here that I've highlighted is the September 1944 uh, storm. And most people probably don't know this storm because it actually didn't really make it up here. Uh, this is the storm, though, that was used for the design um, basis for the three hurricane barriers. Essentially, what they did is they took a storm uh, which was uh, down off of the Carolinas. And that had the largest uh, internal pressure uh, of a hurricane measured uh, along the Atlantic seaboard. They transposed it uh, up into uh, just off of the coast in New England, and then they calculated the storm surge for the three barriers. So this is just a, a little um, picture that shows you, uh, again, the five barriers that the Corps has. Uh, and I say hurricane barriers because uh, all five of these have been designed for storm surge. Uh, the difference being with the three with the castles, again, are the ones that the Corps uh, operates and maintains themselves. And again, all three of those have a navigation gate. Um, and I'll go through and show you each of those. Uh, interestingly, even though they were all constructed in roughly the same time period, uh, the navigation gates are different. Uh, the surge is different, and how they're operated are a little bit different. So the first one is New Bedford, and I'm going to start from New Bedford and work our way uh, back towards the Stamford barrier. But you can see here, um, the New Bedford uh, was constructed in about 1964 was when it was finished, um, and it has a fairly complex system. Um, you'll see there's uh, a series of a Clark Cove dike here, um, there's a, another levee that comes up here, goes into some navigation gates right here, and then a little piece of levee where it ties into high ground, and then there's a Fairhaven dike which is over here. The blue portion represents uh, the area that would have been flooded should the um, barrier, or if the barrier wasn't there and the water or the surge got up to the top of the barrier. Um, the barrier here, uh, the top elevation ranges from about elevation 20 to about elevation 22. Um, so you can see this area prevents, or the barrier prevents, a significant impact uh, from New Bedford uh, in the areas that are uh, just along uh, the bay. So the 
key components, and this one will give you a little bit more of a detail. Um, all three of these barriers sort of have uh, the same uh, key components. Uh, there's a, a, a dike or a levee system uh, that's used to uh, protect uh, the, the, the low-lying areas behind. There's a navigation gate uh, that allows um, ships uh, to pass through. And then there's an interior drainage component um, because all of these were designed to have uh, not only a hurricane event um, coming out um, on the ocean side, but also coinciding with uh, some type of rainfall event, and usually it's a 100-year event. Um, so the interior drainage portions of these are, are fairly significant. So what they want to do is allow uh, interior drainage still to be able to get out even when the gates are closed. So again, this, this system is fairly complex. You can see all of the pump stations. There's a pump station down here. Uh, there's another pump station. Uh, let me see. Uh, there's a pump station right here. There's a street gate here. And again, these street gates are allow passages coming in. Another street gate here. Uh, another street gate here. So some of these areas are, are low lying and not protected, but you also see from the aerials that I'll show. These were constructed again back in the early 60s, so there's been some development that have been out beyond the barrier. So this will give you just a, uh, I'm not gonna read through um, all of the dimensions, but in case you're wondering, here's just an overview of the capacities and the lengths that we're talking about. Um, this barrier is fairly extensive in length. Um, you'll see the, the big thing here is the navigation channel, and these gates are 150 uh, foot in width or at least that's a width of the navigation channel. You'll see how they close in a minute. I've got a close up in some pictures um, and they go all the way down to uh, elevation minus 39. So it's a, a, a deep um, uh, channel and uh, one of the deeper or the deepest of the three that we have. Sorry, uh, a street gate. So in all of these, um, what they end up doing is there'll be some cross streets that will come in and they're uh, a multiple of different sizes but usually they swing closed so they'll sit in a pocket door and they'll swing closed and connect two portions of the barrier together so they're concrete abutments and they'll have a pocket um, metal gate uh, that sits inside and they uh, they hold back the the storm surge so right here uh, you'll see there's a street gate that connects these two pieces of the dike together. Again, in the Fairhaven dike, um, the interesting part about this barrier is that it's owned and operated by three different entities. Uh, the city of New Bedford uh, owns and operates uh, this portion of the dike and pretty much right to here. The Army Corps operates the, the dike, the navigation gate, and it ends here and then the uh, town of uh, Fairhaven operates this uh, portion. So the, the cross section of the dike itself here, um, of the three dikes, this is the one that actually has uh, the most robust um, riprap. And you'll notice that uh, the riprap is up to about a four and a half um, ton stone. It's a graded riprap uh, berm, has a, a random fill in the middle. Um, again, it's not designed as per se a levee where you're worried so much about long-term uh, loading on it, um, but it is worried about uh, scour and wave action. Uh, the top elevation here is about 20. There's a roadway that is down, um, allows passage on the interior side. And, it, and this barrier was, again, designed for uh, the top elevation is 20. It was actually designed for a still water elevation of about 14 and a half, um, about 14 and a half feet was the still water elevation. It, it included uh, some surge, or excuse me, it was uh, 16 feet was the design elevation here. It included about 13 and a half feet of surge, and they added that to 
uh, a mean high tide of about 2.7 feet. So the design water elevation is about uh, 16. The additional four feet accounts for uh, wave runout. Again, just a picture looking down the barrier. The first picture shows you uh, along the roadway on the protected side as you head down towards the gates. Uh, this is the riprap. They actually uh, did an incredible job uh, placing the riprap so you can actually, uh, for the most part, walk along it with relative ease. Uh, but those are pretty big stones. So the sector gates, the, the key to allow passages uh, within the navigation channels, um, th these are gates that sit inside of pockets um, and end up swinging out. And there's rollers that sit on the bottom uh, that the gates roll out and close together. Uh, these gates, again, close about a 150-foot um, opening uh, in the barrier. Um, and are operated uh, by the Corps. They, they typically operate the gates um, at a range of elevations. Uh, they'll have to close it sometimes in this case, um, sometimes as low as uh, elevation uh, three or four to prevent some nuisance flooding. It was originally designed though to start closing around seven. So here's, here's a couple of uh, aerial views shows you. Uh, the top is just an aerial view of the gates um, looking in from the uh, ocean side uh, through the barrier. Um, you can see the Palmer's Island right up here. This is just a top view. You can see how the gates actually work. They close and swing out uh, from the pockets and then meet in the middle and close. There's actually a tunnel that runs underneath um, and this project was actually featured on that show, Dirty Jobs, uh, when they would go in and uh, deep water and clean out some of the, the bearings underneath the gates. Um, and so you can certainly look that up. That was one of the videos that they had. Fox Point. Um, this is a barrier uh, in Providence, uh, protects downtown Providence. Uh, the top elevation is about uh, elevation 25. It was designed to uh, protect a water level uh, up to about uh, elevation 20.5. So again, the extra four and a half feet or so is, is due to the wave action. Um, the key features really here are um, the 700 foot concrete dam that runs across. Um, and there's three navigation gates, uh, about 40 foot wide um, and about 40 feet in height. Um, and so they're not quite as big uh, as New Bedford. But they, again, they allow small boats to go through. The, the feature here that's really the, the biggest one is the pump station. Um, it was designed uh, to be able to pump out the um, Providence River um, when a 100-year storm event coincides with uh, a hurricane event. Uh, so these are uh, uh, significant uh, pumping capacity. In fact, I think it's only um, uh, second to the ones here at the Charles River Dam. And this, you would think a hurricane barrier is good for um, uh, holding back hurricanes and storm surge. But interestingly, the Corps also found out they're really good at uh, also supporting highways. Um, Back in 1990, um, the uh, DOT um, started to reroute 195 and had a great foundation, uh, which was part of the hurricane barrier. Uh, so they built a portion of 195 right on the hurricane barrier. This barrier also does have a clay core. Um, so uh, they had to go back in. And you can see put some uh, clay uh, low permeable material. So they've made some significant alterations to the barrier. But the actual gates themselves still function in, in the same way. So these sector or these gates are a little bit different um, configuration. They're uh, essentially three bays, again, 40 by 40, um, and they sit in an upright position. And I apologize for the drawings, but you have to remember this was also constructed, I think, in 1966. Um, so uh, 
we've had these scanned, but this is the gate as it in the down position where it would sit down on the floor and it ends up sliding up into the up position. Here's a, a picture um, from the side. You can see the gate uh, in the up position and this is the front panel that would actually hold back the surge. So here's a couple of photos. Um, the first one on the left here is looking back through those three um, uh, sector gates uh, from the protected side. And then you can see the pump station uh, uh, on the right. Again, this is all part of the 700 foot long uh, dam or barrier along the Providence River. The third one I'm going to talk about again, and you'll see uh, again a difference here. This is similar to New Bedford uh, in the sense that it's a fairly long and complex system. Um, it starts uh, up here, uh, runs along, and you can see the designation has flood wall, goes into uh, levee. You'll have the gates, the navigation gates here, goes into levee again and then back into some small portions of flood wall, levee, and flood wall. Uh, this system is uh, operated uh, by the core, uh, basically shore to shore again, and the remaining portions of it is operated by the uh, city of Stamford, Connecticut. Um, one thing I, I failed to mention in the first two is the performance during Sandy. Uh, I, I didn't fail to mention it, it just wasn't really that notable. Um, based on the track um, that Larry showed, uh, Hurricane Sandy uh, sort of took a left-hand turn and sort of spared those first two barriers from much of the storm surge. So the storm surge for Hurricane Sandy for those two, or Superstorm Sandy for those two, uh, wasn't even the storm of record. Um, to date, those two haven't really been tested. Um, uh, Fox Point, I think, has only been loaded up to about uh, elevation 11 or 12. And again, it's up to 25. And then New Bedford, I think, is uh, only up to about um, elevation 10 or so. And again, that was up to 20. But this one really saw a test. Um, <clears throat> and you'll also notice a difference here when we start seeing some of the pictures. The riprap is not as extensive uh, on this because of the wave action um, that was anticipated. So this one was designed for uh, an elevation uh, up to about 17. Uh, it was for a uh, still water elevation of about 14 and a half. So there's about uh, two and a half feet uh, of wave action. Some areas I believe go up to uh, top of the berm goes up to 18. So you can see this one has uh, a fairly uh, robust uh, interior drainage system just because of the length um, where you've got uh, penetrations through it, but also some key pump stations uh, here, here, over here, uh, and up here. So uh, each of these pump stations, again, are much smaller in size when you compare them back to the Fox Point. You can see just again, based on the um, capacity, only 500, if you remember, Fox Point was about 7,000 uh, CFS total. This portion, again, these navigation gates are only about 90 feet uh, wide. Um, and again, it's a completely different uh, design. And then a small portion uh, of the barrier with uh, another small pump station. You can see the drainage areas. Now again, each of these were still designed for a, a, f a significant interior drainage event somewhere close to the 100 year. So here's a, a picture of the, uh, an aerial of the gates at New Bedford um, looking in from the ocean side looking in. Um, you don't see the gate. Uh, the reason is because it's underwater. Uh, this is a gate that actually sits on the bottom and is raised up, uh, and you'll be able to see the uh, hydraulic arms in a few of the photos coming up. Um, but I believe this gate uh, goes down to the bottom elevation here is about elevation 18 or ni minus 19 or 18. 
Um, so it's, it's certainly not as deep. Here is a, a cross section showing uh, the gate. You can see here, here is the, um, the sill, the bottom elevation, and then the pedestals that are used. Uh, on this side, you can actually see uh, the layout of the gate as it's laying down on top of the blocks and the sill. Uh, here is just the, the hand railings as it sits down. So the gate, uh, as it's pulled up, it's raised up and sits into place. So here are a couple of photos of the, um, the barrier itself looking in. Uh, you'll be able to see uh, in this corner, uh, in this arm is the arm that actually goes down and attaches to the gate that sits. Uh, this uh, tube is actually one of the hydraulic arms that the arm sits inside of here. So as the gate gets pulled up, these arms pull it back and it extends into the tube. And you can see it again over here. This side is obviously a picture with the gate up. Um, you can see it sits kind of into this pocket uh, and it's raised uh, up. I think it takes um, somewhere in the order of about 15, 20 minutes for them to actually uh, raise the gate. Uh, here, they operate the gate um, in a different manner than the other two um, because the pump stations don't have the same capacity uh, as uh, some of like Fox Point. Uh, they actually have to close this gate a little bit earlier to be able to provide some of the storage on the interior side. Um, so instead of closing it maybe around elevation four, sometimes they could close it as, as low as elevation zero uh, if they think that they're going to get a significant rainfall event that the pumps won't be able to keep up with it. And as I alluded to, um, Hurricane Sandy uh, was the storm of record um, for this system. So this system, uh, the top elevation, if you remember, uh, was about elevation 17. Um, here on the right-hand side was a picture that was taken by our operations folks. Uh, the right-hand side is, is the uh, ocean side. This is the protected side. Um, the elevation out here uh, got up to about 11.1. Uh, uh, which was uh, about a foot and a half higher than the highest elevation since it was constructed uh, and is about uh, four to five feet um, higher uh, than or would have put about four to five feet of water uh, into Stamford, Connecticut. Uh, and the system performed fantastic. Um, you'll see it, it certainly 11.1 may not be a big deal, but when it's um, only you know five or so feet from the top in the highest storm of record, um, it 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 went a long way in the core um, because it hadn't been tested um, since these things were built. And again, this was the last one that was built, which was around 1968. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over, and we've talked a little bit about um, the existing barriers, how they operate. You saw some of the storms and what. Um, predicated the need for those, and Larry's now going to talk about a concept uh, that they have come up with um, based on Sandy or a Sandy-like event. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. That was great. Yeah, so as I said before, um, back in 2009, we were asked um, by the ASC Metro section to put together a design of a storm barrier that would protect lower Manhattan. And, and some of the things that, that you, know, you, you look at, you know, like what do you protect against? Um, obviously, hurricanes. And I was kind of wondering why all the, all the bad hurricanes were named after women. I don't know, Mike, if that was like some kind of bias you had or something. But I mean, I don't, Bob wasn't bad. He didn't make it up there. I don't know, Hurricane Bob. But, um, you know, hurricanes, obviously, there's, there's no question that hurricanes have gross impact on, on the areas. And, and, and Stanford is very lucky to have been protected. Um, but there's also sea level rise, which is, a, is something that we really, you really need to look at. And when you start, the design of, of these barriers is very complex. You know, the idea of like doing the, just putting a wall up at a certain elevation is not that difficult. That's really like the easy part. There's lots of things that you have to consider. Um, so, so like we kind of looked at three different potential um, impacts. We looked at the, obviously the hurricane, we looked at the sea level rise, 
and then um, storm surge. You, you could have a bad storm surge just from a nor'easter coming in the, with the configuration of Long Island. So I, I talked a little bit about sea level rise, and these are some pretty interesting renderings that are that just kind of come out and they're looking at like, you know, what it, some images of what it's going to look like in the future, or what it may look like, you know. Um, there's obviously two camps, you know, there's people that think that it's a real problem and there's some that don't. But it, if you're going to the effort of putting in a, a very complicated storm surge barrier, it's something certainly to think about. And, it, and, and Mike showed you a lot, a variety of different designs and there's a lot of different ways to, to protect. And, but um, from my point of view, you want to also come up with something that, that will protect in the future against sea level rise. And this one, we had to have one in, in Boston here. This is um, the, the, it's one of my favorite buildings down, downtown. I think in 93 used to go through there and it looks kind of like Venice a little bit to me in here now. So, so this is what we did. Um, we were given design parameters um, by the, the Met section and we worked with a team and, and there was four different barriers that they came up with. If I can get this thing to work, I'm killing myself with it. So, um, one team looked at putting a big barrier across this section in here. This is the Rockaways. I'm sure you guys heard a lot about the Rockaways from Hurricane Sandy. It was really devastated. Um, so one would go across here. And then the other, the other three worked in concert. So this is uh, the East River up here. This is the Verrazano Narrows. And this is Arthur Kill that goes along in between Staten Island and New Jersey. And this is the one that, that I worked on. So Arthur Kill, um, if you recall, when I first started talking, I talked about the, the highest storm surge that was recorded. And this is where it was recorded, right up in here. It was like 11.48 feet. Um, our storm surge barrier was put down here in the southern part. And, and it's, it, there's a lot of issues that come into like where to locate it. Because when you locate it, a storm surge barrier, if you locate it, if you decide to locate it here, then you've protected all of it here. But it may be more expensive. And, well, what if we located it here? Then all these areas that would be unprotected, you know, would be impacted. And it's, there's a lot that goes into it. There would be a highly politicized decision on the location of any barrier. Um, Arthur Kill has a lot of uh, very extensive um, commercial traffic. There's there's huge ships that go up and down there to, to help feed, you know, the economic structure of the United States. And so you have to you have to provide a method for for conveyance of those vehicles too. These are the parameters that they gave us. Um, Mike talked about still water elevation. This is the 14.4 is the still water. We looked at eight foot wave elevation that would be on there. And then also you've got a tidal fluctuation. So our total protection for the category three hurricane ended up being about 28 feet. So the basic design goals were, as I said, to protect against a category three hurricane to minimize the impact in the community, um, as I said, depending on where you locate it, it has an in, upstream or downstream has a, a tremendous impact on, on, on the, the community. And we also wanted to, we wanted to provide some sustainable elements and, and provide like some, something that would give back to the community. Anytime you, you consider putting like a structure like this, you know, this is like our little image here. So there's people out here today that to have a nice view of the ocean and you know when we go in and we say we're going to put in this big concrete barrier and you saw some of the ones that you know that Mike had on there they're not necessarily the prettiest thing on there so you really need to also while you're doing your design you have to bring the people along with you because they're they'll be out there in force if you don't some of the engineering considerations that you have to look at as I said these are very complicated um, the, the height is probably the easiest thing you have to deal with there's water quality issues because you're starting to impact the flow. And this is a tidal river. Arthur Kill was, so you've got, you've got flow going in and out. And water quality and sediment issues. And as I said, there's, lot, there's big ships and shipping ports that are along this area, so we needed to provide um, an ability to navigate in there. Um, development of operating procedures. Mike talked a little bit about how, how they open and close the gates. These are, it's very complicated developing the operations that goes for a tidal gate. You know, You've got, a, you've got a lot of rain coming in. They have to really look to see what the hurricane or event's gonna do to determine how they operate the gates, when to close them, when to leave them open. You know, if you start getting water up behind them and your pump isn't keeping up with it, you know, 
what do you do then? So you have to develop a very complicated operating procedure with that. Obviously, there's emergency operations. There would be an immense structural and geotechnical components that would, be, that would be associated with it. Wildlife impacts and maintenance issues go along with it. Whenever you're putting a structure like, in, like this in there, suddenly it's a maintenance issue for you. The, the, the costs that go along with the maintenance are no, there's something that really need to be considered. Obviously, hydraulics are a big issue with it. And to, there's a, and Mike showed you like a variety of different like gates that are available. Um, the one that we end up was, that selecting were, were tidal gates that you can kind of see here, the images that we developed here, that would be in the up condition, the up position most of the time, and then they would close when the, um, when the storm surge or hurricane would come in. Um, I spoke uh, quite a bit about the navigational issues on here, but to accommodate to, to accommodate the sea, potential sea level rise with our structure, we, we decided to go with the lock, with a dual lock structure. Then one of them would provide um, larger vessels, and, and you have to consider things like the expansion of the Panama Canal and make sure that you're providing the structure that will, you know, look at, looking ahead to make sure that you provide an opening that will allow for those type of vehicles. And then we also provided a smaller lock that wouldn't be um, it would be less costly to operate and to allow for some of the recreational boats to go in and out of that. So this is a plan view of, our, of the barrier that we put in and out here. And this is Staten Island over here. Um, points, of, points of interest here is this is the end of the Staten Island Railway. And I don't know if any of you have tried to drive into New York lately. It's pretty, it's pretty tough to get in there. Um, so, and when we looked at community benefits, we, we, we saw that there would be a potential opportunity to provide not only the storm surge barrier, which is located right here, but we put in like a parking lot and, and our concept would, would allow for pedestrian and bike traffic to go across, across the barrier and then be able to hop onto the Staten Island Railway and then get into Manhattan. And these are the two lock structures that we talked about. And these are the gates that we have on here on each side of it. This is a, just an image of the dual lock structure. The one on the right, obviously, is for the larger SIPs. We also, you can see that because that, we wanted to provide the, the pedestrian and bike access, we had to have like a drawbridge on here. So these are dual drawbridges. And we used a, kind of a cable stay type structure on that because we, you know, we saw this also as an opportunity to, to, to have something that the, the community could be proud of. Social considerations, the environmental permitting it would be for any kind of storm surge barrier would be enormous. Um, there was a lot of discussion a after the 2009 seminar that was conducted and then Hurricane Irene came up and now Hurricane Sandy came up and people were, people all over were saying, well, why didn't we start doing it? Honestly, it, it will take you know, over a decade to, to permit and design and, and build a storm surge barrier. There's, there's a lot of people that get involved in it. Obviously, the, the core will probably, you know, if, if they would probably operate this or certainly would have heavy involvement in it. As you guys saw, there, on this particular structure, there's heavy navigation, so the Coast Guard gets involved, the, the DEP and fisheries, and there's a lot of people that would get involved. In, and even questions on who would own it. You know, Mike, Mike was saying that in some instances they owned it, and other instances owned by a municipality. So that decision is a big issue because you then you have to deal with the ownership and the maintenance that go along with it. And I spoke already about the location of the barrier and how you're saving some people and not saving other people. I, I spoke about getting the community involved. Um, this is any type of a project like this. You need to have. You need to have the, the backing of the community on there because there's people that will be adversely impacted that won't want to build it. Um, so one of the things that we wove into it in addition to the, the transit-oriented development was um, we also took an opportunity to, uh, that we felt we could put tidal power generation in and then also um, enhancing the recreational activities. Along the barrier, we'd be able to provide opportunities for people to, to fish and stuff like that. That's a sea robin there, in case you're wondering. Pretty critter. So this is a cross section of the of the barrier that we that we came up with, showing the the tidal power generation on there at the bottom, because you'd be constricting the flow 
Um, right now, Arthur Kill, there's not enough tidal movement on there to get what to get to me an effective tidal power generation. But when we put the barrier in, we constricted the flow, so we were able to get enough velocity through there to to produce power. This is the parking lot that we put in there, transit-oriented development, just key things that you're going to need to have these to get people's buy-in. And this is an animation kind of showing the whole thing all together. If we can get this to work here, it'll be good. There we go. So this is uh, kind of like zooming in here, here. Here we go again. Here's Staten Island. This is New Jersey. This is the Arthur Kill up in here. The, Statue of Liberty is over there. The Staten Island Railway comes in right in through here, and it ends right in here. And so you can see that this access here would be really, it'd be a great benefit. As, and as I said, you're always trying to get benefits on here. Kind of like zooming in, these are the tidal gates here. This is some of the, the locks we have in here, kind of zooming around. Drawbridge goes up, lets the, the uh, smaller vessels come through. Right now, the tide gates are in the, in the up position, so they're allowing water to pass through. We're going to be zooming in on the tidal generators here. producing a lot of electricity right now. Sure. And here's a cross section showing the swing gates that we, we, we felt this was a, the most appropriate one for this area. You see like this is like the, in theory, the water coming up, tide gates go down. Here we go again, the closed position. So this would be the ocean side, and this is the Arthur Kill side. This is the parking lot, the transit-oriented development in here. So people be able to park there and then head over, over and hop on the railway. So. That was the concept design that we put together. Um, we think it, it truly a viable method of protecting you know, sections of, of lower Manhattan. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of people have like, asked me, you know, when do you think this will get built or when will it get built? And I mean, obviously, the, with the Sandy coming in there, it, it's got a lot more attention. But it's, I tried to demonstrate a little bit that it's very complicated to build a structure like this. There's a, a lot of agencies that have to really work together to, and come together to put something like this together. And, and, and my understanding is they are, they are having conversations on looking at something like that. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight some of the storm surge barriers that are around the world. Some of the, some of the ones would be very similar to what Mike had in place. But it's kind of interesting to see what other people are, are doing out there. This is, uh, this is one of the storm surge barriers in the Netherlands and Holland. Um, Holland, 75% uh, of Holland's below sea level. Um, this is the, the Eastern Schlet storm surge barrier. And it actually is the largest storm, uh, storm surge barrier in the world. This, this section of it um, is about six miles and it's part of the, their overall called the Delta Works um, storm barrier. And this is a, this is a Google view of it. And I, I was kidding Mike. I was going to have Mike try to pronounce what it really says out there. But I'll let you guys figure that out. But um, you can see that the, the way this thing functions is this is a, a levee part here where it allows some water to go through. And it continues along here. And this is more levee. And it actually has a pretty small, I would say, area for boats to come in and out right in through here. So this is a lock structure in there. So, there, so in this particular location, they probably didn't have a lot of ships that go in and out of it. But I thought it was like kind of interesting. And, and how many people have seen this before? This is uh, was put together for Boston Harbor. And it, it's, it was done by Antonio DeMandro and Associates. And if you look at 
at this concept, let me see if I can do this right, and kind of look at that concept, I'm like, that looks pretty similar, you know, so the idea, so I look at that and I say, well, you know what, this, this probably has some legs, you know, there's, this probably could work out. This is uh, on the Thames. Um, I, I think this is probably one of the most iconic barriers out there. It's pretty interesting the way that it's put together. It's, it's the second largest movable barrier in the world. And this is kind of how it works. It's interesting. It works on, it has two different methods. Uh, on the outsides of, of the river, the barriers are stored in the upper position. You, you may be able to see them here. And on the, the middle parts, they're, they're stored down below, which allows for ship passage through here. Um, this is one of them, in the, the, one of the middle ones in the upward position. And it, it basically is like a big cylinder that rotates up. And, but they have, you can see they've got pretty large mechanisms. But I, what I thought was nice is the way that they kind of made it into you know, something that the, is aesthetically pleasing, which is which I was kind of trying to get my point there that you need to consider that. This is a, actually, a, this is a historic tidal tide gate that was, um, it's in the Kita section of Tokyo, and they call them the Red Sluice. It was this guy, this Akira Yoma, actually, the, the, who designed it, was, he was involved in the Panama Canal also doing that. And what, what's one, what I thought was really interesting is, and apparently a number of the, of the tidal and storm barriers in Japan are operated with, this, with an aqua drive motor, so it's basically, the motor functions on water pressure, so it, it doesn't rely on electricity, which oftentimes when you've got a hurricane, you lose power. You know, like I said, we lost power for four days, so you know, this, these operate w without that. Um, pretty innovative design, and they still are using someone. This one now, as I said, is historic, and, and, and this I feel is pretty interesting, as you can see, this is that, the red sluice here, and this is the new one that they put in. I don't think it's not nearly as, as pretty as the other one. But I thought it was interesting to see the approach that they took to put the new one in, because they, because they had to maintain the historic significance of this one, so they carved in this and put in to provide the protection. This is um, also, uh, and it's a different way of looking at it. You know, we've been talking a lot about, about barriers and stuff, and the big problem is you get a lot of water coming in. Um, another thing that they did in Tokyo is they built these large shafts um, underground, they're about five stories high, and they had a number of them. They end up being about five miles long, and they pump them dry. And this is a picture of one of the big pumps, and this is obviously a dry shaft. So they're, they pro they're providing capacity, a, a really quite a bit of capacity. So then when the storm comes in, they're able to allow the water to go into these big caverns. And this is a picture of, of how they kind of work in sequence. and. The, and you can see on here that, that like a number of the, of the rivers that they have problems with kind of go into it, the Nika River and all these other ones kind of come in it, and then they pump them out after it's all. So there's always different ways to kind of handle your water when it's coming in. This is another um, interesting storm surge barrier in the Netherlands. And this, is a, this one's stored in the upright position. So when, it, when the storm comes in, it goes down. And this one also has um, electrical power generation with it as well. And then I wanted to throw one in for you know the Germans. You know the Germans are very proud, and and they put together this. This is um, a, a tidal structure that it's similar to the one that uh, the concept design that we put together. The gates are up. This is in the up position, a lot of our water to go through. And on the sides over here, there's a lock structure in here. This goes out. It's out. It's located out by the. Uh, the North Sea. So kind of in closing, I got a picture of Mr. Freeman here, and I, and I kind of put him on here because I thought, you know, that, you know, he did a lot of, you know, he, he kind of got out there and, and did some great stuff and had a lot of energy and passion behind. And I think to do these projects, you, you're going to need to have someone with energy and, and passion and drive to really kind of push, push these projects forward. There's lots of challenges. Um, it's, it's, it takes a long time. It's, a, it's not something you can do overnight. Um, but, you know, Mike showed the, some of the benefits that the, the storm surge barrier in Stanford, you know, really, really did a lot of protection there. And it was, um, it's kind of like a quiet hero in my mind. 
there's also lots of opportunities that we want to look at and so when we're looking at the, the storm surge barrier we just don't want to look at just the storm surge barrier we want to look at you know like other things that we can bring into it like the tidal power or like you know the recreational act opportunities we try to almost all the work that we do now we try to weave in other things into that because we need to because we're, we're it's a public project and we need to, to provide more benefits to the public with it so that kind of wraps up our presentation and I guess now we're we're available to answer questions that anyone may have If you, um, you, you certainly would have like, you know, water coming back up behind that, you know, so in, in, in most of the storm surge barriers that you saw on there, they've got like large pumping systems that would back it up. But you also, the question is a good question, like, or what about the, the seaward side, you know, would they be impacted more as a result of it? And they would, you know, because you're, it's kind of an, like an estuary, if you will, you know, where you've got water coming, it would be coming into Manhattan. So yeah, that water, it would it would be higher than it would be without the storm surge barrier. Part of the balance. There's another question. Sure. How much tidal energy can you produce from the system? It um, it's not awesome. It's not like an awesome amount of power. Um, I can't remember the numbers on it, but it, I did the calculations on it, and it was enough to pay for the cost of it over a 10-year period. So you look at that, and it's not going to like power all of Manhattan, but you're, it, it, you know, oftentimes when we're looking at, at things like that, we look at like the, the payback period on it. That's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, the, the question? The, the question was, um, on the Arthur Kill storm surge barrier, the elevation that we had, it was like, why, wasn't, why didn't we have like, uh, the bridge kind of high enough to allow the, 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 the boats to go through, and that way we wouldn't have to stop the pedestrians from going across there. And the problem, why we weren't able to do that, is that that area, the width of the Arthur Kill there is, is too narrow, so it would have been really steep to go up there, and it would have been pretty tough on your bike to get up there. So, and all along that, but it's a good question. It is a good question. Okay. Can you give us a sense of how much these projects cost and how many people are involved in the construction? Well, for the, the core barriers, um, again, uh, they were authorized in the 1950s and constructed uh, in the early 60s. And, and the way that the, the cost sharing worked, um, the, the community paid a certain portion and usually most of their monies uh, for the construction were associated with uh, the taking of the land. So the dollar values that I have for construction uh, really were just construction, didn't include the lands. But uh, New Bedford uh, was the most expensive, and that was around uh, $20 million uh, in 1964. And then um, I believe uh, Fox Point was around $16 million, and Stanford was about $15 million. They, um, the, the shafts that they built there in Tokyo, those were about $3 billion. Um, and, and the Arthur Kill one that we looked at, we didn't do a detailed, a detailed estimate cost system, but we were looking about 50 million for ours. Um, along the idea of the cost of that has there been any discussion about changing it from the pedestrian walkway to the actual roadway so that it gets um, the toll so that you can maximize the total time? There hasn't been any discussion 
along those lines. But I mean, it, there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to look at that, you know. And uh, it, certainly, there would be an ability. That I think the people that lived there would even hate it more when you've got a bunch of cars going through there. But you could do it. You definitely could do it. In the back, way in the back, CDMR. Oh, yeah. Uh, you spoke a bit about some of the limitations of the forest. Well, I certainly wasn't around when they were designed, yeah. but uh, the, uh, there is a, a lot of ongoing, uh, and, and I certainly also think from the permitting side, the regulations uh, were not as robust um, and followed because, again, uh, just like when the levees were built um, as a result of some of the, the catastrophic events, uh, a lot of the agencies and even the communities came together and said, hey, we need these things to help pr uh, protect us. So there was a, a lot of agreement and uh, they found solutions to mitigate some impacts. So I don't think, uh, I can't speak too much to the environmental impacts, but they do, we do have a lot of um, O&M that happens on these barriers, uh, most notably with uh, keeping up with the gates, but also dredging of the channels. Um, and that's a significant portion of the cost and part of the reason uh, that the Corps uh, ma maintains and operates the, the ones with the gates because we do have that uh, responsibility for uh, the navigation and the dredging that's a part. So that is a big par portion of it and actually a, a really big part of the, the long-term operation and maintenance. Yeah, I've, uh, I've been fishing out in that area, you know, so I think one of the disadvantages is that the type of barrier that they would put in there would, 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 would really restrict navigation through there. It's a, there are lots of ships and recreational boats that go through there. It's a pretty broad area, so you'd really be kind of forcing, uh, there'd be a lot of marine traffic going through there. That probably would be, to me, one of the big negatives of that. I mean, one of the, I think, a, a positive, I think it, it would be probably more economically viable. Um, and there is a, along that, and I'm familiar with the, with the, with the, the pathology in that area, that, there's a short, there's actually a reef that goes through there, so it's not even that deep. So there is a lot of, there's a lot of pluses to that. But that, res, but restricting that, the navigation, I don't know if you've been. What's that? Yeah, you could do that, you could do that. But it's, it's tough, because it, if you start looking at, at, at like sea level rise, then it's like a lock system in there, you know? So it's, then you're really restricting people, so. Sir. Um, a couple of things. Um, how do you go about deciding where you want to put the barrier? Um, and parenthetically, is it some kind of evaluation of optimality, or is it sort of a mix of yeah, we don't want to restrict, um, we'd sort of like to do this, but we don't want to res restrict, restrict navigation, we don't want to, you know, you know, so how do you go about picking where you're going to do the barrier, and in conjunction with that, how is it decided where there would be core barriers in New England, the locations that you decided, as opposed to wherever else there might have been an interest in putting them, and related to that, you may, as an engin uh, engineers, come up with some suggestions, but then, I think you alluded to this but didn't go into it, there's a political, I presume it's a political decision that gets made somewhere down the line about whether to actually do it and where to do it, for example, uh, moving forward in, 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 in around New York City. Um, so. That's a good question. I can tell you what, that neither Mike or I are going to locate one of those things. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, when we looked at the Arthur Kill one, it's a balance. You know, we ended up putting ours as far 
like downstream, if you will, as possible. But at that point, we knew it was going to be more expensive because it was a longer stretch on there. And when we looked at ours, it kind of we really saw that the linkage to the Staten Island Railway, you know, is like a key feature that made it make that made it made sense. So it kind of drove it. So we kind of pushed it as far downstream as we could and, and said, we'll absorb the cost of it because we're going to be protecting more people. And we're going to, and, but we also get some benefits, some side benefit with it. In terms of some of the core, like what's the core going to do? Yeah. Let Mike answer. So as far as the, the barriers um, that were put in place, um, again, the big one, uh, as you alluded to, is uh, I'm sure those folks in those communities had a lot of um, political willpower behind them because um, political willpower and also uh, they were impacted by previous events. So any time for the Corps um, to get involved in a project, um, and it's any type of flood damage reduction project, um, there has to be a, a, a need and a community must said, hey, we have a problem here. Um, so the, the Corps did a study and, and in there came up with, uh, for the most part, it was they did those barriers before they did any benefit cost ratios and those types of things. So really the, the sightings were set based on uh, looking at what was, where were the areas that were flooded before. Because take New Bedford, for example, a lot of the areas that are now um, developed outside the barrier, that was just open land. So they basically put the barrier up where the furthest development was. Um, but they also then did look at the height um, by looking at a series of storm events to be able to set that height. So the location was really set based on where the furthest development was. Do, do either of you have any thing, any opinions, I mean, uh, informed opinion about what m should be done in, in New Orleans to protect New Orleans? I'm not going to touch that. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. No. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I don't have enough information to, I think, provide uh, a detailed response to that. That was clever. Right. Yeah. The design lifetime. Yeah. I don't know. Do you guys have a design life? Well, I, I, they're well past it by now. Um, yes. They're, they're um, it, I mean, in general, it, it, they were originally designed for 50 years, but most of which uh, are earthen materials. So you wouldn't expect a problem with those as long as they are maintained properly. So that's why the core is a big push to maintain uh, the barriers. Now, the gates, uh, the pump stations, those things obviously have a design life. Um, but, uh, you know, interestingly, we've got pumps that were put in back in the uh, early 40s that still operate fine. Uh, so as long as they operated and maintained, they're okay. But it's generally a 50-year design life, but as you can see, they still operate now. There's been some upgrades and modifications. I think it's someone else. Yeah, the reason that we had them that way is we felt it'd be better for in terms of like we didn't feel we'd we'd have less sediment build up on that side than the downside than the other side of it the way we designed it. We were like with operation if we had it the other way we felt that there would be more of an opportunity for sediment to be built up behind the structure, and so you went to close them they wouldn't close properly. Although, you know, Mike talked about the ongoing maintenance is something that you really had to do. You really need to maintain and. And operate these structures along, but that was that was our thinking behind it. Right, right. There would be less energy to close it. Right, right. Uh, yes, that's true. Yeah, we weren't. We, yeah, we didn't do the Verrazano Narrows um, structure, but we were. I, mean, I was with the people that, that did. I mean, it's much. It's a much longer structure than ours. About four times longer than our structure, and they ended up using 
uh, the gate similar to what you saw in New Bedford for their design. So they did the horizontal once it came in and closed out on it. They had, it's, um, I think New Bedford's like 160 feet. 150. 150 feet. And I think they, I think they were, and I'm, don't quote me on this, I think they were around 200 on the, on the narrows uh, for that structure. There's a channel that goes right down the, the middle of uh, the Arthur Kill. They're, it, they, they've excavated down there, so the currents really flow like really you know longitudinally through there. So there's not there's not a lot of cross currents in there. Wind wind obviously would be more actually more of a problem for that, but the, you would have the width of them set up, and also you would be you'd be seeing they'd have like tows, you know, tow boats taking the, the, the vessels through those locks in reality. Up in the back. Uh, no comment, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, we, uh, we do, um, from time to time, do update the, the cost or do calculate the cost. I haven't, uh, I don't have that information, but it, it's done um, at incremental uh, foot levels. Um, and then, of course, with the cost of housing always changing, uh, it's not always accurate. Um, but I don't have that, but that's something the core is starting now to develop as a, a success story. Um, and these barriers, you can actually um, probably follow them. Uh, there's probably some information online, uh, but I don't think they post the actual uh, dollars prevented. I don't think anyone thought that. No, I mean, you could do it. it that the reef. I know there's been several studies throughout um, places in the world about in order to naturally beef up these existing reefs and then, you know, avoiding this multi billion dollar structure. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think. I mean, the, my, my humble opinion is that it's not, that wouldn't work, that they wouldn't work. Yeah. This is my. You know, it's, that reef is pretty small, you know, and I've seen some of the concepts that, that were put together, like other methods, but it's, uh, you look at the damage that was done, you know, and you really need a pretty sturdy, solid design, properly designed device to really protect from the storms. Yeah, well, it's a compound question. So it was done as like a, it was, a, the, the premise, it, was, it really came from New York uh, DOT, their infrastructure staff wanted to look at what could be done. They drove her through ASCE. Um, there was a, a group of, of engineers that came up with, the, with an approach, a, very, a variety of different approaches for the protection of it. Um, there is, the core has, has, was not involved in this at all. And there has been discussions, obviously, since then. There has been follow-up meetings where people have talked about what would be appropriate to do it. But it, the idea is it's been out there for a long time. Of People felt that there could be something that could be done. Um, 
and it finally got enough energy to go through a process to, to go through a design, you know, like it wasn't like a design competition, but it was like a group of people coming up with what they thought would be good designs on there. That was really the base of it. Base of it. And the, the second part of your question was yeah, Staten right. Island. Yeah. Yeah, you, Staten Island is the majority. Of Staten Island is is high enough. Is high enough. But if you look at some of the impacts from Sandy, some of the the eastern shore of Staten Island took a beating. Took a beating, and and depending on where they where they put their their barrier in at the Verrazano, it would depend on on the degree of the impacts that happened there. On our side, we are we benefit with pretty quick slopes that came up. As you think about either of you, um, is there anywhere along the New England coast um, above New York City where you think there should be protection that isn't, doesn't currently exist? Well, I, I mean, I guess it would uh, have to say where, again, any area that's below the surge elevation could be impacted. I guess the better question is, uh, do people need it? Um, and, and really, that's not a question that, that we answer because the way we work is uh, a problem comes to us and, and you look back at uh, historical impacts. Um, I have heard that other communities uh, do want to look at um, barriers, but again, that's on their individual uh, levels. We, the core, don't typically, or we don't go out and say, hey, we think you need it um, based on this modeling. We actually will then come in and support them if they believe they need it. Because there has to be um, a need and a nuisance from the flooding. And that's not something that we can justify. So if, who, understanding your, 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 your response, who who, who out there are either of you aware of who may be saying or beginning to think that, that they, they do see a need that, um, you know, stepping back from your limited sort of take on it as, as, as with the Army Corps or, or with the, 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 the firm, it's like, you know, are there people out there, communities who are saying, you know, maybe we should think about a more significant um, uh, barrier or form of protection? I, I don't know a specific community, but it, I mean, anyone that's along the coastline that saw Sandy come, um, I, I, they must have had some type of um, internal discussion that, hey, we would, we would love to have the same type of protection. Now, whether or not it's needed, uh, that's their bigger question. That there, the um, one of the the barriers that I showed in the Netherlands also has a there's, there's tidal power generation associated with that. I, I don't know the megawatts coming from that. When we looked at the units for the Arthur Kill, we were getting like one meg like per unit coming out of them, and really would depend a lot. We, you know, you'd have to do some pretty finite hydraulic analysis to really kind of test how many openings you would need to go through there. It's not awesome, you know. It's not a lot. But like I said, that what we look to pay back, that's the way I was kind of look at, like how quick can we pay it back on it. But there's, I think there's definitely potential. You know, I like tidal power generation. I think it's something we should be looking at as a group. One of the things that people think about is storage. You know, you know, storage for energy. Right. Right, I think there is. I right, know you've been dying to ask a question here. tried to uh, let them control a lot of it, but they gave some of it back to us. Um, the, the, uh, especially after the highway was put on top of it. 
Um, but the, the main reason uh, that the Corps actually controls those is because of the navigation channel. There's a federal navigation channel that goes through and is the reason for those gates. So the Corps has uh, a group that is in charge of operating and maintaining the channels. So it just makes sense that if you're going to maintain the channels, you don't want to have to worry about the coordination with a local sponsor to open and close the gates. So we then, on almost all the, on all the barriers in New England, we operate from shore to shore.